On March 12, 2011, at 8 a.m., Rachel Ordley, the manager of the Lululemon store, arrived at work to open the store, as she did every day. When she noticed the door was open, she assumed it was the negligence of the person responsible for closing the store the night before. When Rachel entered, the lights were off and clothes and accessories were lying everywhere. When she saw this picture, she realized that the store had been robbed, so she screamed and asked if anyone was there, to which she heard a groan that startled her and she rushed outside to call the police. Next door to Lululemon was an Apple store that didn't open until 10 a.m., but there was a man named Ryan Hogg standing outside waiting. Rachel asked him if he could escort her to Lululemon, to which Ryan agreed without knowing the context of the request. The day before, the second-generation iPad tablets were unveiled. So, according to Ryan, he waited for the Apple store to open so he could purchase one of those products. As they entered Lululemon, Rachel asked the man to go to the back of the store to see where the groaning she had heard earlier was coming from. Ryan walked into the back room, saw a body lying face down in a pool of blood, and yelled to the manager to call the police as it appeared there was a dead body of a man. As the man was leaving the back room, he noticed another woman there with her hands tied. She appeared to be unconscious, but it was apparent that she was breathing. Ryan told Rachel about the lifeless body and the still-living woman lying there, and that it looked like they had both been abused. At this point, the manager made a second call to the police. Officers quickly arrived on the scene. It was about 8.20 when they saw the horrific scene. The store had apparently been robbed. One of the women was lying dead in a pool of blood and completely bruised, while the other was alive but unresponsive, bound with duct tape and wounded in the face. They were Lululemon employees Jana Murray, the dead woman, and Brittany Norwood, the survivor of the attack, both of whom worked the evening shift and closed around 10 p.m., meaning just before closing time, someone came in and attacked the women. It was still unclear if it was robbery or revenge, or if Jaina was trying to protect the store so she was killed, while Brittany may have complied with the perpetrator's demands and survived. Brittany Norwood was taken on a stretcher to a suburban hospital so they could treat her wounds and see if she needed to be hospitalized. At this point, they did not yet know how serious her injuries were. There were visible lacerations on her chest, legs, arms, and forehead, but the most striking one was a 5-centimeter cut on the victim's right thumb, possibly sustained while trying to defend herself when she was attacked with a knife. Jaina Murray's lifeless body was taken to the forensic morgue where an autopsy was performed. The result was unexpected as the attack was brutal, with more serious injuries than her partners, suggesting that she may have actually attempted to confront the robber, or there was a possibility that Jaina was the reason the man came to the premises to directly kill her. The autopsy showed that there were a total of 330 wounds on Jaina Murray's body, which means that the attack was extremely violent, which usually implies that it was motivated by anger. From the number of wounds inflicted, it can be inferred that this could have been a very personal attack by someone who hated her. At the crime scene, forensic investigators also found one of the most important pieces of evidence in the case, a bloody print from a size 46 Reebok athletic shoe. They concluded that it was left by the man who committed the attacks. Both female victims of the attacks had athletic backgrounds. Jaina Murray was born in Houston, Texas on November 22, 1980. She was 30 years old at the time of the murder. Her family consisted of her parents, David and Phillies, herself and two other siblings. Everyone said she was a very positive woman. Jaina also traveled all over the world. In particular, she even traveled to China to study. There, she took the opportunity to travel around Asia and also traveled to Japan. And one of her hobbies was keeping healthy by practicing sports and yoga in particular. On her last birthday, when she turned 30, Jaina filmed herself bungee jumping. This also shows that she was an open and smiling woman, and her fanaticism for sports was evident from a very young age. Jaina was involved in all kinds of sports and dance. She studied ballet, jazz, tap, volleyball, and more. Some details of her life also include a passion for Mexican food. Moreover, on each of Jaina's birthdays, her family goes to her favorite Mexican restaurant to reminisce. And the truth is that everyone in her life says only good things about her. No one understood why Jaina was hurt, why she was killed. Investigators questioned everyone, even her boyfriend, whom she was about to marry. But no one had a motive, apparently Jaina had no enemies. But someone secretly still hated her. After graduating from college, the girl went to live in Arlington, Virginia, to pursue higher education at Johns Hopkins University. It was during this time that Jaina went to the Lululemon store in that city to find a job, but the store told her that they were not looking for salesmen, but that the Montgomery County store in Bethesda, Maryland was hiring. 
The Maryland store was a half hour away, but she didn't want to pass up the opportunity because she loved the brand. Jaina sent in her resume and was hired a few days later. She got the position not only because of her knowledge of yoga, but also because of her charisma. Jaina became one of Lululemon's top salespeople. Unlike Jaina, Brittany, who was the second victim of the attack, had a somewhat more complicated life. Born into a poor family with eight siblings, Brittany Norwood didn't have many reasons to smile. In her own words, she and her family were constantly plagued by racism. Despite this, her classmates noted that she never lost her temper and was a lot of fun. In this she was helped by sports, in particular, soccer, because Brittany played it in her high school and became one of the star players in the sport in her neighborhood. Soccer then earned her a scholarship to attend New York University. Her dream was to play soccer as a member of the official U.S. women's national team and to compete in some sort of World Cup. Unfortunately, lack of money and opportunity interrupted that dream. Brittany studied sociology at the university in New York, where she had a scholarship, but then moved to Arlington, Virginia, where she had two jobs, at a hotel and at the Lululemon store. However, she was reportedly transferred to the Montgomery County store shortly before the attack. Both women lived in the city of Arlington at the time of the attack and led different lives but had a similar passion for sports. They could have been targeted by a criminal who pursued them with the intent to harm. Sadly, one of them died, but at least one woman survived, possibly to bring justice to her partner. The first details recovered from the crime scene included a bloody footprint of a man and a knife, which was the primary weapon used in the attack. Though investigators note that several items from the store were used to inflict all of the wounds on Jaina's body. In addition, three wads of money were missing from the safe. It should also not be overlooked that the woman survived the attack. Brittany Norwood's story could explain how everything happened and who was responsible for what happened. At the very least, the description could lead police to a clue. The robbery indicated that it could have been the primary motive. But the number of injuries was not consistent with the way robberies are usually carried out. In most cases, robbers do not intend to kill unless they are faced with the need to do so when they may be discovered or the person is unwilling to comply. Also, these murders usually happen quickly, usually with a firearm but the attack on Jaina was done with a knife and the person took time to torture her. On March 12th at 2.35 p.m., Brittany Norwood was first interviewed at Suburban Hospital. She said that the attack was not carried out by one person, but that two masked men entered the premises. One of them took care of Jane and the other attacked her. According to her version, she was abused with a hanger. Brittany was unable to elaborate further on what happened because she was under sedation. Officers agreed to interview her again in the coming days if she recalled anything else. That same day, investigators interviewed employees at the neighboring Apple store, which was open until 11 p.m. Then, knowing that the attacks must have happened around that time, they asked if anyone had seen anything. Then the first witness came forward who had only heard voices. This person said he heard two female voices. One of them was shouting, talk to me, don't do this, tell me, what's going on? and the other female voice was saying, Oh my God, help me, please help me. Then all he heard was screams and moans, and when it subsided, the man noted that he heard the sound of someone dragging something. Despite this, the witness, an Apple employee, surprisingly did not call the police. He simply reported the matter to a security guard who went to check the Lululemon store. He looked out the window and noted that there was nothing strange and returned to the store. This employee also said that he later reported this fact to the manager of the Apple store and that he left work around 11 p.m., at which time there was no more noise. Detectives on the case went to Brittany Norwood's home to see if she remembered anything else about the incident. When they entered the home, the woman, still in some pain, invited them into the living room to talk. There she was asked if she remembered anything else from the past two days to try to identify the two men she mentioned. Brittany then attempted to explain how the events had transpired. She said that when the two men entered the room, one of them headed straight for her and the other grabbed Jaina. Brittany described her attackers as white males wearing ski masks and determined from their voices that they were anywhere from 25 to 27 years old. She noted that her attacker was approximately 165 centimeters tall and Jaina's attacker was slightly taller at approximately 180 centimeters. They were dressed in black and wore gloves. Brittany also said that after her partner was killed, her attacker went to rob a store and the other began to abuse her. When she began to talk about Jaina's murder and abuse, she began to cry. Brittany had obviously been through something traumatic. But investigators needed to get as much information as possible because she was the only survivor and the only eyewitness at the scene. 
Brittany also noted that the man told her that your name is Brittany and you live on so-and-so street, which scared her even more. But she also told investigators that she thought the perpetrators probably saw two bills in her wallet during the robbery for internet and gasoline that had her name and address on them, which she said were stolen. Another detail that Brittany mentioned is that her attacker, while taunting her, started insulting her and even made racist remarks. And after the abuse, the man pushed her on top of Jaina's body, which was lifeless by then. Detectives asked Brittany if her family was supportive, to which she said yes, that she had had conversations with her family about moving back to Seattle to be safe, but mentioned that she had recently started a new job in Bethesda and was looking forward to starting work once she recovered from her injuries. Because the attackers knew Brittany's address, detectives gave her a direct contact in case any of them showed up at her home. But in analyzing the evidence they received, detectives discovered something new, something that didn't make sense. Among that evidence was a medical report that caught their attention. It said that Brittany Norwood had not been abused, and it described the injuries found on her body, some on her arms and some on her legs. But most notable were a cut on her forehead, a scratch on her back and a 5-centimeter cut on her right thumb. Compared to the wounds that had been inflicted on Jaina, what they had done to Brittany was almost nothing. But why would she lie about the violence? On the other hand, another witness came forward. Brittany and Jaina's boss recalled the situation that happened the night of the attack. She said that around 10 p.m., she received a call from Brittany saying she had forgotten her wallet at the store and asked her to contact Jaina to come back and open the door for her. It was Jaina who locked the store every night, and she was the only one with a key. Four days after the attack, investigators began to speculate that Brittany might have been hiding something. Thus, she became a person of interest to the investigation. Because Brittany was needed to submit hair and fingerprint samples, the investigators informed her that they needed to meet with her that same day to continue the interview. They never told her that she was a person of interest to the investigation. They only said that the samples were to rule out her presence at the crime scene, which is a routine procedure that is usually followed if a person other than the suspect was at the scene. However, the purpose was clearly to see if they could prove that Brittany actually committed the assault. The investigators also asked her to stay late because they wanted to interview her. And this was very important because this is where they could get inconsistencies in her story, already knowing that she could be a suspect. The interview lasted two hours and 55 minutes. The first hour was spent taking samples and the rest of the hour was spent questioning Brittany's testimony. She kept mentioning that the assailants were two white males. She was asked if she knew what kind of car her partner was driving, but she said she didn't know. Brittany gave other details, talked about being afraid to face one of them, and cried when she talked about Jane. Investigators released her and asked her to return at 10 a.m. March 18th. Officers were waiting for crucial evidence to make an arrest, and that evidence was surveillance footage from a parking lot near Lululemon, where Brittany was seen alone behind the wheel of the victim's car. The March 18th interrogation, the fourth for Brittany, began normally. She reported that she was excited about the prospect of moving to Seattle to live with her brother Chris, but that her only concern about the move was that she wanted to continue to assist in the investigation. The senior detective then asked Brittany again about Jaina's automobile. Again, she replied that she did not know what kind of car her partner drove. The detective then showed her a photograph that showed Brittany parking Jaina's car in a parking lot a few blocks away from the scene on the night of the attack. Brittany then said that her assailants had forced her to move her car there and that they had been following her at all times. She further noted that when she arrived at that parking lot, she saw a police car but did not call for help because she allegedly feared for her life. However, she could not be seen at all from the Lululemon store because after two blocks she turned right and simply could not be seen, and this is inconsistent with her testimony that she was allegedly followed. The detective then told Brittany that he did not believe her story, that there were inconsistencies in it, and that it was all made up. She was read her rights and arrested on suspicion of Jaina Murray's murder. By this time, several pieces of physical evidence had been released. DNA from Jaina's fingernails confirmed that the scratch on Brittany's back was inflicted by Jaina during the attack, probably in defense. Although not much surveillance footage was found, the ones that were available showed only Brittany, but not the two white masked men. In addition, the woman was never abused. She withheld details in her testimony and changed many others to make it look like two people committed the assault. The prosecution also had witnesses against Brittany, soccer teammates from a university in New York who said that Brittany was nice, but she had a little problem. She was a kleptomaniac. She was constantly stealing and as a result was expelled from the university and lost her scholarship. 
He was also proven that the wound on her right thumb was inflicted when she attacked Jaina. It was also found that she had tied her own hands to simulate an assault. Several wounds on her body were self-inflicted, and she lied for days to the authorities as well as to her family, who had believed for months that Brittany was innocent. On top of all of this, it was proven that the bloody male footprint found in the store was made by Brittany herself using a sneaker that was later found in the store. The hardest part of the trial was proving why Brittany brutally murdered Jaina. What was the motive? Five items that Brittany allegedly used to inflict the wounds on Jaina's body were introduced into evidence. A hammer, a dagger, a clothes hanger, a stick taken from one of the clothes hangers, and a Swiss army knife. It was proven that the motive was not to steal money, as the money missing from the safe was found hidden in the same room. In October, the trial began. The evidence was so overwhelming that Brittany Norwood pleaded guilty to the crime of self-defense and claimed that the attack occurred after Jaina said mean things to her and attacked her first. The trial lasted six days and the jury found her guilty of first-degree murder. On January 27, 2012, the judge rendered his verdict, sentencing her to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Clearly she killed Jaina, the evidence proves it, and she partially admitted to killing her, although she claimed it was self-defense. But the question remains, why? Although the prosecution described the attack as revenge for being caught stealing a pair of sweatpants, Brittany never explained the real reason, what happened between them that made the attack so aggressive. Many believe that the true motive was envy. Brittany was jealous of Jaina's life, and that perhaps the murder was not because of petty theft but because Brittany wanted Jaina's life, something she could never have due to her poverty. 